Well, good afternoon. Uh, I have good news for us. Instead of getting a second helping of Henry Chesbro, we're going to do something much more quirky instead for our final session. Uh, with us uh, to take us to the finish line uh, in this semester uh, is John Jacobson from Quirky, whom I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, but I also want to make sure we're all in sync on the last requirements for the course as well. So once again, I'll pass around my sign-up sheet, and this shows how many write-ups I think I've gotten from each of you. Many of you have done all three. So all that's left between you and the end of the course is that five-page paper, which I'll say more about in just a moment. A couple of you still kind of far behind. Uh, I do want to see all the write-ups uh, by this time a week from today, May 7th. So May 7th is the deadline for getting me your write-ups. So for some of you, that's just turning in your last one. For a few of you, that's turning in more than one. So uh, be warned. Um, then a little bit about the paper. I think we had a discussion about it last week, so nothing new to report here. But if, in case you weren't here, uh, five pages. You can have extra exhibits if you want. Please do reference those exhibits in the text so I know why they're there, which might seem obvious, but I speak from experience in asking for this. Um, I do want you to discuss four things. I want you to talk about the definition and the significance of open innovation. I then want you to talk about what insights open innovation brings to innovation that weren't already there. What you see as the strengths and weaknesses of the concept. And I want you to use illustrations from both the book and the lectures we've had during the term to support your arguments. So basically, if it's a paper that I read and I truly cannot tell that you attended any of the classes nor ever read the book, that would be a bad thing. Sorry about that. Um, on the other hand, if I get a really dis exciting discussion full of examples and illustrations that really show not only that you were there, but you really got something from it, that's going to be very well received instead. So I'd like that paper by Wednesday, May 9th. So May 7th for the write-ups, May 9th for the five-page paper. OK? Any comments or questions about that? This is the last time we're going to talk about it. So. If something's on your mind, this would, this would be the time to ask. Yes? 4 p.m.? 4 p.m. And which time zone? Uh, Pacific. Pacific time zone. Yes, right. Good. You're allowed to turn it in before 4 p.m., however. That's okay, too. Any other questions or comments? Okay, great. So with us today uh, from New York, uh, John Jacobson, who is the head of engineering and R&D for a very interesting company we're going to learn a lot more about called Quirky. How many of you know about Quirky already? Have any of you been a part of the Quirky community? No? So in last week's Economist, they had a special section on the future of manufacturing, in particular the digitalization of manufacturing. And there was a very nice story in that special section uh, all about Quirky. And they actually used the phrase, and John's not quite sure how he feels about this phrase, social manufacturing. So if nothing else, you've probably not seen those two words side by side before. And uh, after today's presentation, I think you have an interesting sense of what Quirky's up to, why the name is quite apt. Uh, and I think you'll also see some interesting comparisons to some of the earlier innovation communities we've talked about during the term. I'm thinking in particular of Innocentive, for example, in the community uh, that they operate. The quirky community has some things that are quite similar to Innocentive and some things that are quite different uh, from it. So with that, John, I'm going to get you a bottle of water and turn it over to you. Awesome. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks for the nice introduction. And uh, it's kind of fun to see that only, like, I think there's only one person who actually knows about uh, the company and I got it too. all right two it's two 
Um, and, but uh, I'm, I'm delighted, I mean, because it's, it's fun for me to expose people to what we're doing. Um, and uh, I'll try to keep it sort of interesting and entertaining. So it's, it's, uh, I'm not going to use PowerPoint, so I apologize um, for that. Um, but uh, I'm just going to kick it off. So um, Quirky is, by its name and definition, is a pretty quirky company uh, in terms of our business model and what we do. Um, we are essentially a sort of conduit for the average person with the not so average idea for a product. Um, it essentially is uh, a, plat a platform, an online platform or a tool um, where people from around the world can come to collaborate on bringing a product idea to life. Um, and the fundamental formula, which is sort of very different than a lot of other companies, is that it is about our community plus sort of an in-house expert product development team. So it's really this, this is the sort of the formula if there is or had to be a formula. Um, so for instance, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about this and I'll, I'll kind of go into it a lot more uh, about it, but it's not crowdsourcing. So um, typically, we are sort of lumped into that sort of category. But I'm going to speak to specifically why it's not and why it's very different. And hopefully, you will sort of see that. And it will be very apparent um, and also sort of exciting. Because I think crowdsourcing is sort of has a has plus side to it if you're the winner. Um, or if you participate, you, know, you get the reward or whatever it is. But um, the downside is it's sort of you feel like you've been abused or used and abused in a way. Like you're not really part of it. You're just sort of there to contribute and get an exchange, like paid for it or something. So um, without further ado, our, our sort of motto, our sort of hallmark of what we are about is that we make invention, the act of invention, sort of accessible to the everyday person, wherever they are. Um, assuming you can get online, um, it is sort of an online platform. Um, we do get some mail from the jail sometimes, but we're not able to actually, um, you do need to log on and you need to be sort of a member and have agreed to the terms and conditions. So um, we don't take things via the post. Um, so I guess from that point of view, maybe it's maybe not as ac accessible as it could be, but um, fundamentally, um, again, we are all about making invention accessible. And when you look at sort of, you know, there's, there's books on the inventor's dilemma. There's, there's lots of material out there in terms of when you look at what it takes to invent something, um, it's actually quite difficult. It's quite hard. Um, a lot of people have ideas. They get kind of somewhere into the process. But the reality is um, there are a lot of things that sort of stand in the way, um, whether it's access to capital, um, whether it's um, access to manufacturing, um, concepts around even protecting your idea. So let's say you did have something really cool, a really cool idea. Um, but at some point in that process, you, you know, you're going to sort of reach a hurdle where you say, can I actually protect it? And can I get to market before somebody else sort of takes that idea and runs with it? Um, so there's, there's lots of barriers. I think as humans, we're sort of innately creative. I think it's genetically wired in us for survival. Um, to be able to sort of mash a couple things together and come up with something else or to find innovative ways to find food or to hunt or something, you know. So if you, if you think about it historically, like we're just wired to do this. Like we're, we're creative people and we tend to sort of, on occasion, we're more creative than, than others. Um, but in this sort of land of making a product, um, again, most people can only go so far. They just have the initial spark, the initial idea, but they're unable to sort of really get it through um, the rest of the phases. So again, Quirky as a company is really um, the fundamental sort of what we're about is making that accessible. Um, really just getting people um, the ability so that we do the heavy lifting. Um, and that means you know, every aspect of once an idea sort of comes in, we take it from there and run with it. This is what it looks like. So right now, if you had an idea, if you logged in, and you could log in either using your Facebook account or you can create your own account. It's pretty fast and painless to create the account. But this is the portal. This is what it looks like. So this is quirky.com. If you go there, you would see um, basically this 
button here where you say submit your idea now. So let's say for whatever reason, this morning on your way somewhere or whatever, you stumbled upon something that wasn't working quite so well or you had this idea like, hey, that's a really cool idea, that would be a great product, whatever it is, um, however you stumbled upon it, the point is you come here and you just sort of enter it in, right? So you submit your idea. And what does that look like? This is how the, it's really just two things we're asking for. What is it? So here's your, you know, what is your idea itself? And then basically, what are you trying to solve? So the problem and sort of the solution. Um, you'll see some categories, so it kind of lists out some categories, and this is, again, basically, um, you're gonna see things that are sort of very just in the mainstream of human activities. So things around the kitchen, things in sort of, you know, with pets, storage, organization, things around the home. So these are sort of classic things that we're sort of um, arriving at. Uh, the platform itself is not limited. We're not limited to anything, but um, we, don't, we tend not to do flying machines. Um, we do actually get sort of a new area for us is, um, is definitely in um, medical. We start to see more and more sort of, we have aging populations, we have people, you know, there's, there's definitely people that have needs in certain areas that are sort of more medically related or um, trying to improve things in that medical space. Uh, and this is nothing, nothing new. Um, I think uh, a lot of times if you look at um, certain very institutionalized sort of um, industries, you'll find that they haven't been touched by design in quite some time. So a lot of those things, you know, when, when sort of people just put their brains on it and they're like, well, Apple products look like this and somebody, some other good design products look like this, so why can't it look that way in a medical environment or why can't it look like that in some sort of school environment? So you see a lot of this sort of cross-pollination of um, just the everyday person sort of wanting a good design in, um, in some other areas and other categories. As an ideator, you sort of enter your idea and put it into the system. And what happens is it becomes part of this sort of um, collection, part of this community of ideas, which are then curated by the community. <coughs> so the community is producing them, and the community is also sort of evaluating them, questioning them, potentially commenting on them, saying, I think that's crap, that doesn't make any sense. Um, they're potentially saying that's awesome, or if you added this to it, it would be even better. Um, so the, the process is, is very much around collaboration um, and within the community themselves, and it's community curated. So that means that they're actually sort of helping to filter, to comment, to vote, et cetera, to sort of make it better and better and better. Uh, recently, not too long ago, we sort of launched uh, accessibility, you know, to kind of with more mainstream devices, so sort of, you know, through iPad or iPhone and stuff like that. So applications actually for anyone, any place to be able to access um, sort of the Quirky platform, quirky.com, which again gives you this ability to sort of submit your product idea, but then also participate. And to participate, what I mean by that is if you, let's say you're, you don't have a product idea, you can still come to quirky.com and actually participate in the different phases of development. So that means concept phases, things like naming, uh, taglines, um, sometimes color material finish, what we call CMF. Um, and you'll see this word here in the middle, the influence. Everything you do on the platform, whether it's submit an idea for a product or whether it's to contribute in any way throughout the process, it's tracked. It's all recorded, your contributions. And in some cases, depending on what it is that you're contributing towards, there is a certain amount of influence available, a certain percentage of influence available. And that is recorded. So this notion of influence is basically the reward system, the point system, the reason why people fly a particular airline time and time again, the same one, even if it's going bankrupt, um, is because you want those points. Um, you want some return on, on your time. Same thing here. So people come to the platform to either contribute an idea or to also participate in any of the ideas that have been submitted um, and wherever they are in the process. And basically we record that influence that they have on a product. And it translates fundamentally to a royalty, lifetime perpetual royalty when the product goes to market. So this is sort of the end game. This is why people do it. 
But again, it doesn't have to be that you're just the, um, you have the crazy idea. It could also be that you're just contributing to participate in helping the other ideas along in the process. So what's funny is I, I have the prop. I didn't even know I had it, but it's actually here. So I'll show you. So um, believe it or not, this is one of our, the inspiration for one of our new programs and new products. Um, it's a huge campaign for us. Um, it's sort of the reinvention of this, which sounds silly, but believe it or not, it's a huge campaign and Target's buying it and it's gonna be in the stores this summer. Um, and this was uh, a very interesting story. So this was sort of uh, a community member had this idea, was sort of in our archives, and uh, we had a sort of a challenge from the retailer to actually do something for a season that's called sort of back to school, back to college. And basically, it's this idea of um, reinventing storage and sort of these sort of solutions around when you're going back to school or if you're going, uh, you know, first apartment or something like that, the concept of sort of the storage bin or the storage device like a crate or a milk crate. Um, and the, the retailer wanted us to do something in this space. They wanted to, to they give us some space at retail. So they said they challenged us with bring something to market, bring something new, bring something fresh. Um, and we had seen that um, storage bins and things like that are actually uh, one of these sort of top sellers during this period of time. Um, it's sort of a common thing. It's just a very basic pragmatic thing. Um, what we did is we were actually looking at this sort of concept of reinventing this, uh, and we wanted it to be more than just a storage bin. We wanted it actually to be um, something that you could sort of live out of once you got where you're going. So it's not just the milk crate, but once it gets there, it sort of transforms into other things or has other functions or features to it. So... Um, this is what it looked like in terms of the submission from Jenny Drinkard. It's a real name. Um, and she sketched it, you know, like you see right here. So these are just, you know, kind of some details, the different things and the ideas and the concepts around what she wanted. You know, so she's talking about dividers. She's talking about, you know, just again, as a storage system. So taking it beyond sort of what you would conceive as just the basic milk crate, but how do you transform it uh, into a little bit more like furniture? Once she kind of dropped that in there, again, this is sort of some of the, you know, the feedback from the community, sort of giving their sort of two cents on it. Um, for the most part, it's pretty pleasant. There's nothing really in here that's sort of, um, no one's really beaten up on it. But um, again, it depends. Sometimes you'll, you'll get plus and minus, sometimes, uh, you'll get people saying that already exists. So you'll see people saying, here's a link to a product that already exists. So there's, the feedback is really sort of, um, it's ruthless, it can be ruthless, but it, it can also be just brutally, it's just brutally honest, it's just true. Because, um, people really want to sort of um, either, you know, they wanna bring the idea in, uh, up or they wanna bring it down. They, it's this, um, it's really interesting in the sense that I think the, the quirky community, and I'll kind of talk about this in more detail, but is very much about, um, it's engaged in the health of the company and the health of what we're doing. Um, it wants the product to be good. It doesn't want to create a crappy product because that's bad for the community, that's bad for the company. Uh, one of the things that we do um, every week, sort of uh, another sort of major um, definitive thing for uh, Quirky and for the community is actually evaluate the product ideas every week, the top ideas, the top rated ideas, um, every week live stream to the community. So this is um, what you're seeing here is there's sort of a panel. Uh, the entire company is about 60 to 70 of us in New York. Um, so the entire company sits down. We have uh, robotic cameras sort of like that one right there. Uh, we live stream in HD um, to anyone that basically the community that wants to sort of log in can be several thousand at the time logging into something like this. Um, and every week we go through the top ideas. So there might be 10 to 15 ideas that we're evaluating every week. And what we do is we sort of, um, they've been sort of curated by the community and then they've been sort of curated by the, the, the 
quirky staff themselves, and they've sort of made this top list. So we have already know that these are sort of the good ones for that week. Um, and what we do is we actually just go through them sort of uh, in a very, um, just kind of rip them apart in terms of all their different criteria, whether, you know, design criteria. Um, we look at competitively, does this product exist? Is it out there? Um, when we're doing this live, so we're just kind of clicking through the links, we're, we're displaying them. If we see, you know, there's a product that already exists, we say, all right, that's it, it already exists. Um, we just kind of, in a very live, very rapid fire way, um, we sort of, you know, try to sort of determine, is this worthy of invention? Is this something that we, that's something here? Um, and sometimes the ideas are, they come with videos. So the submitter will have created prototypes, they have videos, they have a very elaborate sort of way to present their idea. Um, sometimes they have patents or they have provisional patents or they have, you know, they're pretty far along in the process on their own. Um, and sometimes they come with napkin sketches, so they're pretty rough and there's nothing there and you're trying to sort of imagine what this thing is, but you think there's a spark of an idea. So it really covers the full spectrum. Um, but this is sort of a, a key part of our process, which is every week we evaluate um, the best ideas and we make a decision to move those products forward in the process. And we will pick anywhere between, um, it really just depends on what, on what we have that week, but essentially we are picking two products every week to move forward in the process, two or more. Every now and then when you're involved in creating a consumer product and, and, and being in the world of product design, you come across a product and a project where something just magical happens. You come across a project where both the idea, the marketplace, and sort of the logistics and the process that uh, is going to be used to, to bring that idea to fruition all sort of aligns in a way that brings you into a territory that you've never been to before. It allows you to push the boundaries of what is accepted and what is acceptable uh, in both the design of a product and in the logistics uh, that's used to actually pursue it. So, um, we've never done this before. About four weeks ago, one of our retail partners sort of challenged us to reinvent the sort of back to college space. We sort of were looking through the archives for uh, inspiration and things that were submitted to the site in the past and stumbled on an idea you submitted. Do you remember which idea that was? Yes. What was the idea? The milk crate. Hi Corksters, my name is Jenny. I am hoping that these milk crates and a few other quirky additions will be the solution to messy lockers everywhere. Are you ready for a little demonstration? Wow! Oh my god! You know, these things can be seats, it can be um, side cabinets for your bed, they can be desks or like consoles or sideboards. Um, there's really a lot of opportunity here, and once you start sort of really playing with these items, you really get a sense for the uh, potential. On this product, I mean, the stars have aligned, and, and we're finally able to test out this theory of manufacturing in, in the USA. You know, what was just another plastic item became this, oh my god, we can make products here. We can actually do this. And the benefits of manufacturing at home are huge. You know, maybe it was a half hour drive out to the tool maker, and let's say it's a three hour drive up to the manufacturer. I think that's just so unique in today's world where many things are made abroad. Being able to have great dialogue, great conversation, real-time brainstorming, real-time design and engineering sessions. That's pretty meaningful. And it'll turn out to be a better product because of it. And the speed will you know, be there because we had the conversations up front. We're not spinning our cycles at the end. So in the process of revolutionizing the crate, we've created this blank canvas that can be accessorized for just about any living situation. There are endless possibilities. Endless possibilities from storage to drawers to lighting to cashers to, to decor. All of these things come into play. And now it's time for the quirky community to go to work. In addition to the normal phases of the design process, we need the quirky community to take this blank canvas and come up with all kinds of accessories for different user scenarios. We can't wait to see what the community comes up with. So this is just sort of a, um, <clears throat> this is, you know, the way that we connect with our community is very much around telling stories. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of, 
it's crucial to what we do. Um, we essentially, we sort of, you know, we need to honor and sort of celebrate the inventor. Um, and it's what it's about. Like, we want to be that sort of trusted partner for them. Um, and I don't know if anyone's ever followed any inventor services or has ever looked online for that kind of stuff or seen any advertisements around inventor services, but they're pretty cheesy, they're pretty sleazy, they're kind of really weird. Like, you know, it's, they sort of promote a lot of things that they're going to do for you uh, in exchange for thousands of dollars and they'll get you patents and they'll get you seat at the table at some major manufacturer. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of that stuff has been, uh, you know, sort of an abuse of, uh, you know, um, and sort of a transgression um, on the consumer, meaning a lot of times they don't get what they thought they were going to get. Um, and I think what we're trying to do here um, fundamentally is sort of be that, uh, that trusted partner, that, that uh, trusted place to go. Um, this particular program that we're talking about here, which again um, is sort of you know, reinventing this guy and kind of bringing it into a new place, um, for us was sort of a, a pretty radical challenge in the time frame because it was actually just a few months ago, um, probably two months ago, that we started and we decided that we actually wanted it in stores this summer, um, which is quite ridiculous uh, to do that in that time frame. But the company is pretty agile and um, kind of hungry and everyone really loves these sort of challenges. So um, we were, you know, kind of rallied to that and presented to the retailer, you know, some really cool concepts and really interesting things. And they kind of really bought into the whole thing and they said, all right, do it, let's do it. Um, we sort of then raised the bar once again and we said, all right, well, we're going to take this one step further. We're actually going to make it here in the U.S., um, the whole program, um, which for anyone that is familiar with sort of modern day product development, that's not that easy to do. Um, most things are made abroad um, and even our company for the past couple of years, we've been making most things abroad. So um, it's sort of the nature of the beast uh, based on cost and, and different factors. Um, but this was for us, again, was sort of this um, to embrace it kind of head on and say, how can we do this? How can we make it work? Um, and let's see what that looks like. Um, and it's been quite interesting. So, you know, it's been about not just celebrating sort of the inventor, but, you know, Someone like, this is Tom Lamarca from, this is the, the third generation, uh, um, basically, uh, owner of the tool shop. So this is where the, the molds for the plastic pieces for this, um, you know, this is a fairly complex um, tool to make this. Um, it has multiple parts coming together, like a part that slides in here, a part that slides in here, a part that goes in here. Um, there's lots of stuff that has to happen to inject this in plastic. Um, and basically, um, it's him and his, uh, he's got, I think it's two sons and, um, you know, it's just a really sort of, um, down to earth sort of, um, facility, but out in New Jersey. And we went out there and met with them and, um, you know, we're able to interact with them directly, um, and kind of have in, you know, um, in person meetings very easily, um, this is Boris, he's doing the uh, mold drawings. So those are, um, you know, this lives somewhere down inside there and all the other stuff is really basically like the, the mold making. So he's actually designing the mold making for that. Um, and really what this is about is, again, it's about this sort of constant dialogue and constant collaboration at every point throughout the process. So what, what really separates Quirky from a lot of companies um, is that we're sort of we're truly this sort of end-to-end -end spectrum. A lot of people say to me, so who are your competitors? Who are your contemporaries? Um, and it's actually hard for me to name any because most people don't do it the way that we do it in the sense of from the social network part of it, owning that piece to all the way down to sort of really, um, it's not like we, we don't own our own factory, but we are basically doing every last detail that gets handed off to the factory. So we're owning that entire spectrum. And that means everything from, um, again, the design sort of phases, but then you know, the social network, the internet side of it, the online e-commerce side, the legal side, the distribution, the logistics, the tooling, you know, managing all those things, the POs for the tooling, um, the warehousing of the product, the shipping of that. Um, again, it's like many, many companies sort of jammed into one um, and creates this spectrum. 
And again, what you saw here was um, another key part to what we do is um, this sort of celebrating the inventor. Um, and it's done in sort of a little bit of a, you know, we had a reality show on Sundance. Um, they did six episodes, um, which was sort of a nightmare to try to work and do a reality show at the same time, because it was like, all right, I gotta go work now. Like, that was, I'm glad we did all that, but I still have to go work and do my work. Because when you're capturing it on film, it's not real. You're just talking through the stuff, you know. Um, it was a cool experience, nonetheless. It was, it was more of a, a docu-reality thing. It wasn't scripted, so it was definitely real. And nothing was scripted. The conversations weren't scripted. But um, to cut to the chase, the piece that we liked about what they did in the, in the Sundance series, which was called Quirky, um, was that when the inventor came in, it was like this cheering and this clapping, and that it was really, again, about celebrating the inventor and bringing their dreams to life. Um, and I think there is something about that that is sort of, it just feels good. It feels right. It is the right thing to do. It is sort of the responsible thing to do as a company. Um, and I think more and more you're starting to see this sort of social responsibility of companies, corporate, you know, uh, sort of the corporation. Um, just, you know, I think historically, even if you just take the definition of the corporation, is sort of there's lots of layers to protect a corporation. Um, and I think there's this sort of, you know, the, the modern thing tends to be where you're seeing a lot of major brands, very big brands, you know, and again, you can go through all the list of them, but, you know, whether it's Nike or Walmart or whatever, you know, all trying to do certain things to become more and more um, responsible. Um, and I think for us, there is that, it just feels right, it's natural, like, this person has this idea, and we're going to help them bring it to life and bring it to market. Um, so there's a lot of things that we do to sort of celebrate that, and... The other part of it is, I don't know if you can see that there, um, we present big checks, fake checks that you can't cash anywhere. But um, we basically here we're giving her 10 grand, um, which is sort of you know like her royalty check uh, for the initial order. Um, when you sell into Target, the nice thing is Target has 1,700 and like 56 stores, so it's pretty cool um, because you have a pretty nice instant market and even just filling those doors with 10 products each or something is, you can do the math, it's pretty easy math, but um, it's a lot of product already, so it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so sometimes with initial orders just to fill the store, um, the original ideator, or the inventor, gets a pretty sizable chunk of money um, just off of that, so you know, just the initial order itself. Um, and again, there's not just the inventor or the ideator, but also everyone else that participates. Um, and in this particular program, uh, it just kind of kicked off. So even if it, there's still some of the phases are left to contribute. Um, but for instance, like within a couple days, there were like several hundred names. People, there was a naming phase. So there were like several, several hundred names you know, within two days. Um, and again, uh, the way it works is you submit the name. So you, you would get, if the name get chosen, you would get the influence for that, but then also voting on the chosen name, you would get influence for that. Um, so this is, again, how this process works. So it's not just about the fact that she's sort of getting initial, uh, or not initial, but primary sort of um, influence for her idea being brought to life, but it's also everyone now that participates in the projects in different phases of that as it goes forward. So. Um, we're seeing that products will come out with about on the order of a thousand influencers, which means they all get a small piece of royalty. The inventor getting the, the, the lion's share at usually about 35%, and that 35% is, um, gets multiplied either by 10% or 30%, depending on whether you're selling into retail, like Target, or um, the 30% um, at the, like in an online store. And inside here, in this package, um, is actually a, uh, a list of everyone that influenced the product. So if it's 700 names, 700 names are listed here with their percent. You know, so what, what you're going to see um, if you do go online and start to follow this program is there's going to be more sort of video stories and updates and, again, sort of keeping the, com the community informed, but just anyone in the world kind of informed, 
you know, getting the different perspectives on what makes this program interesting or what, what the challenges are um, and so forth. And I think, again, this is sort of this thing where we've seen in social networks, you've seen, I feel like we're starting to cross over into what I would call the age of mastery, meaning the fact that we're able to go online, the fact that we're able to do what we can do online is sort of like, that's the boring old stuff. Like now it's how much more interesting can it really get and how can we master what we're doing online and to the, to the extent of get more and more meaning out of it or more and more value out of it. Um, so I think for us right now, you know, this is a, a key piece is to really be able to tell these stories and to sort of, um, to really connect with people in a, in a much more meaningful way. And, and part of that is not, not just us doing that for the sake of doing it, it's just that that's actually what people want. They want to participate in things where there's, it's meaningful, the exchange is meaningful. Um, and not just in a monetary way, but just in a meaningful way. So this is what the site looks like, and it's counting down right now, basically saying it's going to be in stores. It's less than this, obviously, because this was snapped the other day. Um, and we'll have video updates, so we'll do things there that kind of keeps the process going. Um, we have some animations to kind of get people to think about how to use these things. And we'll have some phases. So that'll be um, content that we'll create again for different reasons, but you know, um, to kind of in, in this particular example, we're, because we want this thing to be sort of like this building block that then you accessorize. So we're just trying to get people to kind of think about what that looks like. Um, so the accessories came from the community. This group here, because of the nature of this particular program, came internal, um, and part of that was based on our time constraint. We had to deliver a sort of somewhat um, we had to deliver a system, a baseline system. So um, this group here is sort of the group that we, we, are, la we are launching as sort of um, that basic sort of set. Um, but then what we've done is on the right there, you'll see there's a naming phase, an accessories concept, and a pricing game. And those are like the most immediate things right now to participate. The naming one just closed, and the other ones have a little bit more time on them. Um, you can see the days left. And this is, again, this is sort of a key piece to sort of the quirky platform is that these things are timed. So they're timed events. So this means there's a sense of urgency for you to participate. They're going to expire. If, you know, we need to get that data, but it's also basically getting people sort of, you know, engaged in it. Um, and we send email blasts to let people know what's going on or, you know, how those, uh, what to participate in or what's coming. Um, in this example here, what we did is we said, even if you just order these, so if you actually put these in order of your priority of what you think you would like them, um, we'll give you influence for that. So participating in different ways that give us feedback, so market data in terms of which accessory is going to be the most popular, just using our community as sort of some, a litmus test, um, we'll give influence for that. For pricing, we do the same thing. We have a pricing game. Let's see if I have it here. So these are some of the concepts. So this is concepts that are being submitted again, and there's hundreds of them. I think it's up to, it's more than 600 different concepts already for like just accessories. Um, but you'll see some of them are done, you know, it could be as simple as just taking a, a photo of something else that you have in your home and you're kind of saying, I just want that, but hooked up to the crate thing. Um, in some cases, people are actually trying to use the models or taking snapshots of our videos and then kind of doctoring them, photo editing. Um, to some degree, state of the art for a person submitting their idea is still a, kind of a napkin sketch with a, your cell phone snapping a, a photo of it. A lot of people don't have digital tools at home to do actual 3D renderings or even to do digital sketching. Um, and to some degree, you can't really sketch with a mouse. Um, you can sketch with tablets, so that's kind of changing things a little bit. But if you think about it from a point of view of articulating your idea, um, we're still a little bit in the dark ages. 
So um, I would say that that's definitely an area when you're looking at uh, what we're doing in the in this sort of 3D product development space, um, new tools are needed. Um, and I would say that's probably you're gonna see over the next, um, next few years, you're gonna see a lot of new tools coming out that are making it, um, it's starting, but you know, basically, if, you know, examples would be like, you know, really super, super easy um, uh, 3D tools, you know, like CAD tools, like computer-aided drawing. So those kinds of things, making them extremely easy to use um, and accessible, let's say, on you know, the devices that we have. Um, and it's starting to happen, but again, it hasn't really hit in, 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 in uh, it's not really at that sort of critical mass yet. But uh, the more and more you, know, you have these kinds of platforms where you want to know what people think about an idea, but you want it articulated in a certain way, we're still a little bit in a clunky phase uh, of that. This, is, uh, this was a snapshot of some of the names. <laughs> So they're a little, some of them are goofy. Um, but this is, the, this is the beauty of open. <laughs> you get it all. So, um, but again, what you'll see is that <clears throat> when you're going through this, you have the ability to contribute, but then you also have the ability to vote. So you, could, you can vote, and you have only so many votes, so you basically use them wisely. Um, and hopefully try to nail the winner, right? That's the, that's the game side of it. So it has a little bit of this sort of gaming aspect to it. And what we're seeing is now with, with the product line growing and uh, with more and more community members and more people participating, we're seeing it's almost like this notion of a portfolio, like a royalty portfolio, and people diversifying their portfolio. Um, and also this aspect of maybe even uh, like micro royalties in the sense that they're just playing a little bit in each different phase across many different products. And they might be getting fractions of pennies or whatever, but the point is it all starts to sort of add up and it's, for the most part, it's, it's relatively uh, speaking, it's passive income while you're sleeping. It's sort of clicking, clocking, making money. Um, and then this was sort of, I think this was the summation of this is what the naming phase, and I guess uh, what we, we were just looking by votes, and I think it was showing that in this particular case that the, the name came up to be uh, was crates, was the, uh, what most people voted for based on what was created. Um, something I mentioned earlier, another one of the phases that you can participate in is pricing. So this is sort of, this is a little bit of the, the sort of the holy grail in developing a product is knowing how to price it. The product doesn't exist, so how much should it cost? Um, this is sort of this very interesting sort of um, part of the process that's quite challenging and, and historically has always been done in very different ways, but um, you know, whether it's focus groups or those kinds of things. But here, again, we have the beauty of a very large community. So our community has uh, just crossed the 200,000 mark. So that's 200,000 members that are sort of pretty much engaged in what we're doing. Um, we're about three years old, so that's pretty good. It doubled, uh, more than doubled, from about a year ago. So about a year ago, it was probably about 60 or 70. Um, and we're at 200. Um, so the interesting thing is, while, sure, it's not at the scale of looking at, let's say, the whole US economy or you know, potential per, uh, customers, but the point is, we still get, um, some really interesting data in terms of when we present products or ideas um, and we ask people about price. So, and we do that with sort of um, these questions here. There's actually four of them. So this question one of four, um, these sort of four um, historical questions uh, sort of digging into sort of the psychology of, uh, of, of pricing and pricing strategies, um, but basically asking a series of questions four of them, um, the first sort of before you even get to the questions is whether you would buy this or not. Do you even find the product remotely interesting? If you say yes, then we kind of bring you through these questions. Um, but basically, we, we are getting, um, these are the questions here. So is, you know, is it too cheap? And you kind of give your price. Uh, is it a good bargain? What would you consider the price? A bit pricey, too expensive. And once you complete the pricing game, then it actually kind of, it will report this kind of telling you where you are relative to the community. So it gives you that kind of feedback. But again, it's a little bit of a game. 
um, but we're also giving influence for that participation. So again, when I said, I, I kind of started off the thing about, you know, making invention accessible, you know, inventing, you know, something or creating a product or even designing it or developing it or engineering it is to some degree is n not, you know, I don't want to say it's the easy part, but sometimes that is the easy part. You may have the best product that you designed and built, but if you don't have the marketplace for it, if you don't have the distribution for it, um, if you can't get it in front of anyone, um, then it's not that interesting. Um, so one of the things, uh, you know, for Quirky, again, as a company, is we're dedicated to the retail side of the equation. So it's very much about getting your product to market. That's what we want to do. Uh, we want to do it for the inventor, but we also want to do it for us as a company. So Doors is basically just different, unique stores. Um, most of it's U.S., but we are sort of distributing around the world, so South America and Europe, et cetera, et cetera, um, in addition to sort of the online store that we have and other places that we sell online. Um, One of the things that we did recently, which was kind of an interesting test of our community, um, which was we asked them to test our products in their home before we take them to market. And <clears throat> we instituted this program as sort of like a seal of approval, a little bit of a last check before we get this thing actually into the market, um, just to make sure that everything is kind of working. And the way we did this one is we said, um, we just asked people if they would volunteer to do this. And they were sort of resounding yes and people wanting to sign up more and more. Um, so it was kind of, a, for me, it was a very interesting sort of testament to the fact that it's not always about that they want the royalty or the influence. They actually just want to participate. Um, and to some degree, you're finding that it's, it's the actual inventors, right? I mean, the person that came up with the idea and the product is getting ready to go to market. And they're sort of excited to actually see it and test it and play with it before it goes to market. Um, and it's their friends, and it's they told two friends, and so on. So it's it's very much this sort of um, there's a viral aspect to it, um, and I think um, again this is just for me is sort of an interesting statement on how our community uh, thinks about what they're participating in, and it's not always just about um, getting a sort of a cash reward for that participation. Um, this is the online store, and this is kind of looking at this product here. Um, this is the Pivot Power. This is one of our flagship products, um, kind of very early in quirky history and very successful. Um, and just a great story all around in terms of um, the inventor, uh, Jake Zian. Not sure where he's, there he is on the bottom there, Jake Zian. Um, was a student, was a high school stu student and um, had submitted this idea to like a NASA thing, like some sort of NASA, you know, um, invention or innovation thing. And he won the NASA thing and got like the $500 check and the pat on the back and good job, kid. And, but that's, that's how we do it. That's how invention works, right? I mean, that's, that's the level of support that you get is that. And so the reality is what was he gonna do with that? Was it gonna do much? Um, you know, so he wasn't bringing that product to market with $500, at least not easily. Um, maybe one really tiny one, uh, or a few tiny ones. Um, but he, um, he stumbled upon Quirky through probably like in one of those in-flight magazines, with some little article there or something, something silly like that. Um, a family member, I think, told him about it, whatever. So he submitted his thing, uh, his idea, and uh, it, was, uh, it was sort of... Uh, you know, it kind of resonated with, with uh, Quirky at the time. Um, and it was the kind of thing where for the company, it was also this sort of the spirit of the company sort of jumping into something where we didn't necessarily have the domain expertise. So we, we, we weren't necessarily making a lot of electrical products. Um, but I think it was very much about what the company, you know, sort of stands for is this, again, this idea to really be there for the inventor and do what we can do to sort of bring their ideas to life. Um, and so um, this is sort of really a, a you know, classic example of a lot of different things uh, coming together. Again, embracing someone that had actually designed something pretty cool and had received some recognition, but had no outlet, no channel for that, no place to go, really. Um, at least nothing easy, meaning, sure, they could have started walking into 
you know, um, all of the sort of players in, in power and, and, and so forth and try to sell their idea or something. But that even in and of itself is very daunting and a lot of times there's no feedback, meaning in those things. Meaning you sit, submit your idea to Tupperware but there's, you never hear back, there's nothing. There's no real dialogue or exchange. Um, and so for him, you know, this, is, this has been uh, quite an interesting ride. So uh, I'm gonna ask how much do you think he's earned to date? Who has some, any, any thoughts or ideas? Any numbers, throw out some numbers? How much? Okay, any other numbers? I'm just gonna take a bunch and then we'll see. 50, okay. 10 million? <laughs> okay. 500K? Anyone else? No? 2,000? Okay. Um, the uh, 100,000 is the closest, so yeah. 104,000, like 310, I just checked today. So, and there was some change too, 43 cents, I think. Is that publicly visible? It is publicly visible, yeah. Yeah, again, the, the transparency is sort of just rampant <laughs> everywhere. The company's information, the inventors, the, the earnings, the, the participation, you know, what, what people are influencing. So it's, it's a really interesting sort of um, uh, model around that level of transparency. Um, we have a, there's also a blog and there's a forum. So there's also, you know, sort of the, the B side of things. So there's definitely the forum will be sort of a little bit um, rough around the edges and like forums tend to be. And you'll get some pretty nasty stuff in the forums. Um, but in the, uh, the blog is usually more the company's sort of, you know, perspective on things when we need to make those statements. But there's a, a lot of access to uh, a lot of information. Um, the other things we do, again, is, um, is again, is, is this whole concept of really celebrating. So on the back of that product, if you saw it, um, or on the, um, maybe it's on the inside, or I'm not sure, on the, maybe it's on, right on the face of it. Every product though, basically will have usually like the thumbnail of the inventor, where they're from. Um, and then on the inside or somewhere in the packaging will be the list of everyone that influenced the product, which again, it's growing and growing. So it depends on the product. Some products are a little, they're simple, so there's not many influencers, but uh, on average, it's, it's sort of encroaching on this 1,000 plus uh, people influencing every product. Did you have a similar question? Or? So on that, it actually says right on it. I think it's like 30, it's right there on that, or maybe you can't see it there. I think I have it here. Um, here it is on his, 37.58. So what that means, <clears throat> as the inventor, in general, that's kind of the zone. Uh, it remains sort of the discretion of Quirky to some degree. So if someone is bringing a lot more to the table, like a fully fleshed out idea, something patented or provisional patent, or they've won a design award, you know, we feel that they deserve a higher percentage. Um, if they're just bringing in a napkin sketch and it's pretty rough and we have a lot of work to do, then they might get less percent. Um, <clears throat> and then it kind of just trickles down uh, depending on, again, as we go through the process, all of the phases have a certain percentage available to you. So if it's a research phase, if we're putting out a questionnaire, we might ask for that that phase is worth 10%. So depending on how, how many people participate is how that will be distributed. Um, but this number, again, because the number itself looks pretty high, and it is, in terms of a royalty, it's not a royalty. It is the sort of uh, the factor that is multiplied by either 10% at retail, like at Target, or multiplied by 30% if you're buying this off the online store where there's no overhead. So the, the, that's how we actually um, give the money back. It's either in 30% or we give back 10%, depending on where we're selling it. Um, and just a couple of, these were just, again, kind of going through the retail side of it and how we do it and the story that we tell throughout every part of the process. So even here, these are the shippers. So this is, a, this is what the factory sees. So this is not, any consumer would never see this. But this is, we even put it on the, on the shippers so that we're just sort of telling that story everywhere. So everyone sees it and understands what, what the company's about. And um, this is what it looks like in Bed Bath & Beyond in, in New York in this sort of their flagship store. Um, they gave us uh, a pretty large space to have a dedicated sort of branded statement. Um, and some interesting things, you know, like 
um, especially for Bed Bath & Beyond, um, they never celebrate like an individual or a designer. Like that's a very target thing to do. But um, we're seeing that retailers are embracing what we're doing because they realize that it's different. And it's sort of a, it gives a, a sort of a different side to the product because it's, it's sort of not competitive in a way. It's, it's uh, not, not that it's not competitive, it's sort of, it, it's, um, it helps differentiate what these products are about. They're, these are about solutions, brilliant solutions, brought, you know, fr from sort of your next door neighbor came up with this idea. It's this kind of concept. And that sort of, when people sort of start to connect with that, uh, if that resonates with them, then they're buying into this because they're, that's what they believe in. They think that's cool. Um, other things that we did here, you know, it's hard to tell, but, uh, you know, that's a plasma, um, you know, basically a display. Um, and if you press these buttons, then you actually get content that's relevant to the products. Again, it's always about telling this story, and it's, it's about letting people understand exactly how these products came to, to life. Um, this is their window display. So this is 6th Ave, and um, they let us kind of deck this thing out a few different times and do some crazy things in their window. Um, We've had a bunch of crazy things in the window. We've had large, like, moving hangers, and um, we were actually in the window at one point. It was um, designing for people. You could tweet your idea, and we would sketch it. Um, this is a, an actual screen that's in behind the glass that actually is, again, just sort of telling the story. Um, it's hard to see, but these are all pivot powers. They're, they're empty. but. Um, there's no guts in them, but they were used to sort of create that sort of um, um, mosaic or whatever you want to call it, or montage of all these things. Um, so again, it's it's um, I think what you know, it's just this idea that uh, retail is really interested in what we're doing because we represent a certain fresh voice in bringing products, new ideas, um, and that's what retail is about in some sense is that they want to be keeping it fresh, keeping it sort of topical, keeping it real. Um, and what better story to say, well, these are like by the people for the people. I mean, it sort of makes sense that, you know, that the people out there having the problems um, or coming up with these problems plus solutions, um, bringing those right into the same marketplace where those same people are coming to, to buy them. That makes sense. It connects. It's a very immediate thing as opposed to a product that's been designed in some remote um, very ivory tower-like boardrooms, just really cool design place with Aeron chairs and stuff like that, where those people don't, aren't necessarily the demographic. They're just sort of this, you know, it's, it's sometimes there's that disconnect that a corporation can have when they're designing something. So I think this aspect of open means that you're able to really connect with the consumer. Um, and for us, um, you know, it's messy, it's chaotic, it's not easy to do, but it's also the same thing that kind of, you know, makes it exciting. I mean, it's like I wouldn't want it any other way, and I wouldn't want to work anywhere else because it's just too damn exciting to do it this way. Um, so, again, we talked about this. So it's the 30%, 10%, depending on where it goes. Um, here's, again, the level of transparency. So you can log into your account. You can kind of see what you've earned and where and how, depending on what it was. So the influence, <clears throat> different products. Um, again, sort of um, detailed sort of uh, uh, dashboards of, of everything that you're working on. So here's the product earnings, let's say, for a particular individual, um, all the different products. And you can see some are pretty significant, so most likely they played a more significant role in those products. But in some cases, <laughs> you're seeing, you know, 0.29, uh, you know, it, it's kind of silly, but again, it's just sort of, it's a true testament to the fact that everything is sort of being recorded and it sort of keeps people engaged in participating. Um, and then it looks like this person had a payout request and then also did some other things. Um, they purchased stuff on the online store. Idea submissions are $10. Um, Unless you have a, a, a free submission code, I have some of those. Um, it's on my card, so you can, you'll have one of those if you'd like. But um, it's really, it's $10. <clears throat> we just recently did something in our online store. We're actually selling like a, a Quirky Pro 
um, subscription, so you can actually, uh, for a limited time, for like, I think, I think it's um, $99 or something like that, it's normally $200, but it's $99 for unlimited submissions for like a year. And then also this one, uh, you have this one ability, uh, one uh, chance to actually move a product into uh, what's called under consideration, which basically puts it in front of the quirky staff for evaluation during that week. So if you had an idea, let's say, that you were working on and you're like, this one is the bomb, I know it's the good one, um, I'm going to just send it right through. You don't want to participate in the normal process. So you could just buy the quirky pro thing and, and push your idea right into the thing. So this is, uh, you know, again, you know, as the community grows and, and, and this is sort of standard fare for a lot of online types of things, you, you start to kind of find waves of where the community is wanting more or they're wanting some exclusivity or they want to feel that they're special. So you have to find ways to do that without pissing off the community. You know, so you, you, it's this balancing act of, of keep them still happy and engaged that it's, it's open and accessible. But at the same time, you're going to have people in the community that are going to push the envelope and the boundary. They're going to be really good and they want to be acknowledged for that somehow. So for us, we said, okay, we'll let you put Quirky Pro badge next to your, your little you know, avatar um, and we'll give you some special privileges. Uh, and we do have professional inventors in the community, so it's not, it sounds silly, but there are people out there that literally, they don't work, they just invent. <laughs> so there are professional inventors. <clears throat> and again, we, we do this uh, two times a week. So essentially our sort of mantra is we, we bring, bring two products uh, every week, two brand new consumer products that have never been seen by the world, essentially, um, to life, two every week. And this is a bit of, of a snapshot of kind of where we are. Um, <clears throat> I just counted these sort of this morning. Um, I went online and just kind of counted. Um, company's been around for about three years. It'll be three years this summer. Um, so we have 200 plus products in the portfolio. What that means is like everything that's come in and that's kind of been there and different in whatever different stages, but basically, you know, um, if you do the math, you know, if it's 100 a year, then we're roughly, you know, we should be approaching 300, let's say, if it was two a week that were chosen or something like that. So that's the portfolio. Um, not all of those go forward. Not all of them get immediate attention. It just depends on what they are. Some are more complicated than others. Uh, we had some that we did a special with the Rachel Ratio, and we had three inventors chosen for the Rachel Ratio, and they came to the Rachel Ratio and whatever, and they, you know, they had their ideas. One of the one of the dudes had a um, a paper towel car wash thing, like, but it wasn't for paper towels; it was like for your towels at home. But it would be like this little car wash. You'd run the towel through it, and somehow it would clean it and disinfect it and dry it, and then spit it out like a nice brand new fresh towel. Um, we're like, that's cool, but we have no idea how the hell that's going to work. Um, so there's, there's ideas sometimes that are like that, that we don't totally kill because we feel that they're worth exploring or we may find ourselves in some interesting territory where we stumble upon something. So we, we're, we're trying to, to sort of, again, in the spirit of supporting that inventor um, and believing in them, we're trying to sort of um, you know, follow that dream as long as we can. Um, and we do have some other options to us. So most of the stuff that I'm showing you here is talking about, you know, products in retail, products going to market. Um, you know, some of the other things that we're starting to explore, um, which is just the reality of it, is what about licensing? So what if there's something that's totally out of our zone? That, you know, again, a product comes in or the idea comes in. We want to be open. We want to, we want to let those people submit their ideas. But what if there's something that is just totally out of our zone? And like I said before, like, when you get into some categories like medical or something, there's regulatory issues, there's complications. It's not that easy. But there might be actually some spark or some content, and it could even be patented that they may come with. Um, but again, we, would, we might want to license that or we might want to get that into a different channel. That's just not our expertise. So we're starting to sort of explore those as well. Um, 46 products on sale, that basically means what it means. Um, products in production basically means that they're being made, they're just not for sale yet. Um, and the upcoming, the 111 products upcoming, the upcoming product means potentially it can be made or will be made. There's no guarantee, but um, it's sort of living in that 
zone of it's been launched to the website as a product. So the concept's been refined enough, launched, but we don't necessarily have the commitments. We don't necessarily fully believe in it yet. The retailers aren't really excited. The pricing game information coming back is not really overwhelmingly, yes, let's do it. So they kind of live in that upcoming phase. And that's when you go to the website, you'll see upcoming category, and you'll see all of the different ideas and products, um, some more crazy than others. Like I said, some of them, the towel car wash thing, um, and you know, um, st automatic stirring bowls for the microwave, and there's some crazy stuff in there. But um, So some of them, they, they kind of live there for a little while until we kind of work on them or figure them out. Uh -huh. In net positive or net negative? Like um, the total amount of loyalties given to the idea submitters is larger than the total amount collected from them? Um, just basically, the question is is that a kind of a revenue generator for Quirky or just a way to put a barrier for the idea so they, they just don't flood the whole? You mean why the $10? The, the $10, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the $10 is originally it was 99 it was $100. Um, in the early, early days. But again, part of that was because the company was so small, it couldn't handle the flood of ideas, so it would have like falled, you know, it would have fallen on its face. Uh, so originally it was sort of a higher barrier to entry. Um, but yeah, to some degree it is to sort of filter and give people, you know, so people are actually thinking about this and actually, you know, put a little bit of thought and are, you know, trying to, to, to make it a quality idea. Um, but yeah, it's sort of, um, as far as the, the, how that factors into that, again, for us, it's about bringing the product to retail environment and selling it there, and that's how we make money, and that's when we give back to the community. You know, so it's, at that point, it makes sense. The margins make sense. We've done all the math, and it makes sense. So it's, the submission part is really kind of, doesn't really factor into any of that. It's just uh, it's a little bit of managing infrastructure, but it's also a little bit of a barrier um, in making people think about what they're doing. $10 seems to be, you know, it's the right balance. It's still low enough, but makes people think about it a little bit. Um, so again, just some snapshot on the, on the numbers, a little bit on the community, uh, some of the demographics. Um, kind of what we're seeing, you know, a couple things. Um, it's not atypical for uh, invention type of or design kind of type of uh, community to be split something like this but um, it is interesting I think you know <clears throat> uh, I feel like we definitely have a pretty it's pretty balanced in the sense of uh, again relative to um, just to design related things um, not sure if there's anything really special here we're about sort of 80 20 on the um, US domestic versus sort of international. Um, and I would say, you know, over the coming years, that's gonna be sort of a new, there's gonna be probably a lot of activity around us uh, um, localizing in different regions. You know, so having our website localized, like right now is really, really not. Um, um, you know, and kind of getting other countries more involved and engaged in, in dealing with sort of cultural, more of, again, like localized, uh, more regional and localized uh, localizing of the quirky platform, um, but it is sort of even in these early days. Like there were definitely people interested, you know, around the world, sort of buying the product. So they kind of like it. They like the story. Um, but I think you know the next level of that is really getting it in a platform that is sort of conducive to them from a language point of view, but then also culturally. So there's there's certain things that just different cultures are going to respond to. Um, and, and also making sure that they understand what they're doing and, and even just creativity as a as sort of a starting point is kind of interesting because some cultures are sort of, it's easy and natural and um, other cultures it's very closed and the, the notion of sharing your ideas is kind of foreign concept, no pun intended. <clears throat> um, some more things on the, on the demographic itself. Again, some of the personalities and kind of, um, you know, some of the different products. Uh, pretty much, you know, across the, it's pretty diversified. Um, again, here's Jake, he's a student. Um, 
I think on the lower right, Jared Joyce is, like I said, his professional sort of inventor. Um, and you just sort of everywhere in between. Um, I would say, like I said earlier, though, I think the, there is sort of this interesting thing in terms of how people contribute and how they articulate their ideas. Um, and I think for us, it's also this sort of, you know, we're trying to, to balance it between uh, true collaboration, true involvement versus sort of competition, right? Because again, it's not sourcing. We're not sourcing it for a competition. It's not a challenge that we put out there. It's more of um, we want your ideas and then we want to make them better. We want the community to make them better. We're going to make them better. The, uh, inherently, you're going to, we have professionals in our, in our community who are better at articulating the ideas. So they can actually model something in 3D, they could do some cool renderings or sketch something, and those things get more traction, right? Because it's human nature. I mean, you're, if, you, if I showed you a bunch of words versus like a picture, like the picture grabs your attention and then all of a sudden you're engaged in that and the words maybe not so much. Um, so it's, it's this kind of thing, but you know, for me personally, I would love to have more rich content and more visual content. Um, but again, it kind of, there's this balancing act of, you know, not wanting it to make, uh, wanting, again, from the, from the point of view of keeping it very accessible, not wanting to sort of set the tone that, oh, hey, you know, we only want you to participate if you're really good at doing some 3D renderings or something like that. So it's not, we don't want to reward that or always reward that. So it's, it's, it's kind of a challenging, uh, it's a bit of a dilemma, right? Because it's this open, this open source model is messy in that sense. Um, and it puts a lot of onus on us to sort of be able to sort of keep all that stuff equal, when in reality, it's not equal. Um, you know, the person coming with a little napkin sketch thing with, with nothing worked out and no visuals versus someone who's actually doing a lot of work, um, there's differences there. Um, but for us, it's this thing of we're not, not wanting to sort of turn off the person that can only do this sort of really basic spark of an idea. And part of that is because sometimes that basic spark of an idea is actually a cool product. And that's for us, the quirky sort of in-house product development staff, to bring to life. That's our job. That's what we do. That's this whole idea of community plus expert versus this notion of sourcing it exactly how you want it or very close to what you want. Um, the caveat there is we transform things. We're going to own them. We're going to own the brand. We're going to own the product. We're going to take care of it, manage it, file the patents. We're going to do all that hard work, but that's the caveat. That's the trade-off. We're going to transform it so that it kind of makes sense for everyone involved. So I would say right now, that's probably one sticky area where, as a community member, sometimes that inventor, that ideator, this idea is their baby, and they sometimes are unwilling to let it go. But it's this sort of, again, it's just like these life decisions that you make like you could leave it in the notebook and it will never go anywhere <laughs> or you can take a chance and try to get it out there but then there's that reality that the world is going to kind of beat up on it a little bit the community is going to comment on it and then quirky design staff is going to have their run at it you know and it's this sort of it morphs but the point is sometimes it is about kind of looking at the end game and saying hey at least my idea got out there in some fashion um, but I'll, I'll be honest if, if I get something that's pretty pretty well patented and nailed down and has been worked out and, and some, somebody's been working on it for two years um, and they have a little prototype, most likely we don't have a lot of work to do. We don't have to change it a lot. So um, it, you know, it's sort of, you get out of something what, what, what's put into it. I'm just gonna end on uh, just a short video and then we're, I think we're good. So, and then we'll take questions. We, as a people, must invent. Not because we need to find new ways to make money or to showcase our intelligence, but because it's part of who we all are. We get trains and we start building planes. We get computers and we want to make them personal. We get the internet and we want it faster. We as humans always expect better and are always thinking about what's next. But for centuries, the chances of you successfully inventing a product have been just about as slim as becoming an Olympic athlete astronaut or movie star. How could something so intrinsic to who we all are and so important to moving our world forward be so damn hard? It's time that we make invention accessible. It's time that we invent together. A product at Quirky isn't born in the boardroom. It's born in the living room. It's born on the drive home. 
It's bred by people of all walks of life. People just like you. Every week, hundreds of ideas from around the world are submitted to our website. Very simply, what problem are you trying to solve, and how do you intend to solve it? This ain't no lottery, and it's definitely not a game of luck. Ideas are rated, sorted, voted, enhanced, and refined by your peers, clearly surfacing the top 10 invention ideas every single week. Never before have average folks at home worked side by side with an award-winning design team. The folks we have on staff here at Quirky come from the top design consultancies in the world, Ivy League schools, and top consumer brands. The top 10 ideas are put through a rigorous analysis, something we call DMV. Design, market, and viability. Through assessing each idea on each one of these criteria and putting it through a good old-fashioned debate, the top two inventions of the week are identified, two brand new inventors are crowned, and we thrust into work. From the moment an idea is submitted to the moment we're done, our process breathes new meaning into the word collaborative. An idea moves through a handful of phases to get from pipe dream to finished product. In every phase of development, whether it be doing research, picking colors, defining features, materials, or the name of our products, the community submits ideas, our design team puts in their two cents, and we talk it out until we move forward with the best course of action. We design products with consumers, for consumers, and we do not take that mission lightly. Quirky is something like a machine. Our machine doesn't run on oil or electric. Ours runs on good, old-fashioned passion. Passion for great products brought to life by an entirely design-centered process. We spare no expense at getting things right. We involve not only expert designers, researchers, engineers, and our inventor, but tens of thousands of average people around the world that are representative of the marketplace. Our facility allows us to prototype products the old-fashioned way, or with some of the most state-of-the-art 3D printing and micro-manufacturing technology. Failure is a crucial part of success at Quirky. Quirky is just as powerful in killing good ideas as it is in pushing great ones forward. Unlike consumer product companies of centuries past, we're not tooting our own horn or banging our own drum. We want to know the truth. We want to know what sucks and what doesn't. One of the final tests that a Quirky product goes through is real market testing. Our products launch on Quirky.com complete with specifications, a prototype, images, and something we call threshold. A threshold is the number of units a product needs to sell in order to receive the green light. Once we sell enough product to move forward, on we go to manufacturing. Consumers will receive the products in a matter of months. When it comes down to the details of execution, Quirky is as serious as it gets. From patents to mechanical engineering, material science, cutting hardened steel tools, operating world-class molding, stamping, assembly, and QA facilities, the Quirky team handles all the logistics, and yes, foots the bill. For as long as we can remember, a company becoming successful meant the lining of the pockets of a lucky few. At Quirky, interests are completely aligned with our customers and our inventors. If we're successful, so are you. Throughout the entire development process of our products, we keep track. We track, down to the fraction of a percentage, how much of an impact each community member had over the successful development of a product. Every time one unit of a product sells, all the people who are involved get paid immediately. Our commitment to transparency follows through to no end. You can jump on Quirky at any time and see, down to the minute, how sales are doing. Handling everything from cord management to cookie carriers, every product we make represents its own challenges, opportunities, and its own story. With our constantly growing list of retail partners, press and media partnerships, and our insane brand messaging, products that make it through the quirky process are seeing great success. Whether it be Michael Cavada's Space Bar, Andrea's Strainer Bowl, Jake's Power Strip, or Judy's Spoons, average people with way above average ideas are now becoming successful members of our product development team. Imagine a day not too far away when you're riding in a subway, taking a bus ride, or walking in the park. Out of the corner of your eye, you see something familiar. You see something beautiful. You see something that didn't exist a few short months ago. Something that you helped create. Something you influenced. 
Let's invent together. Let's do what we were all born to do. Let's build a new type of company, a new type of brand, and let's do it right. It's not up to me. Heck, it's not even up to you. It's up to us. Thanks. Take some questions. I also have some cards with that free code if anyone wants to, has an idea, something crazy. Wouldn't it be cool if? Hi. Um, so thank you. This is, this is really cool. Um, I'm just trying to think through the business model a little bit because I, mean, I think one of the, the, the things that must be challenging is that you guys are basically funding the most expensive part of the manufacturing process, I mean, which is the initial sort of small run, small batch of products, the development, the research. Um, and it seems like um, you have a few kind of big hits that, and I'm wondering if it's like the, you know, top products that you can sell in a Bed Bath & Beyond, does that sort of fund all of the other ideas that don't really sell that well or on a big scale, or how does, how does yeah. that all work? Um, <clears throat> no, excellent question, and in the effort, of, in the spirit of transparency. I will tell you what I can tell you. Um, so <clears throat> the front part of the process, sort of launching to the website, bringing the ideas to life, is done in a very sort of low cost, low budget, very digital way. It's all digital renderings. It's all photography, composited, made to look like a product. So that first sort of bringing it to life, putting it on the website for sale, so to speak, in the upcoming section, there's really been no investment. And we've used, the, we've tapped into the community to sort of guide us and to you know, do the research and to make sure we're making decent decisions. But we don't fully engineer it. It's not fully worked out. We don't know where the parting lines are gonna be. We don't know really what's inside and we don't know exactly how it's gonna be assembled. You know, it's like, there's, it's a lot of just, you gotta believe in the concept. And we, we're doing it based on experience. We, we kinda know how to develop a product, so it's not, it's, it's grounded in reality, but it's not, it's very cost effective, that part of it. The next part is if and when we, want to make a product, yes, there's some drop in some serious cash. You know, could be $50,000 on some tools and then it's all the money for the inventory and then the shipping and if you need to get it in the store in time, then you're air freighting stuff, you're doing some silly stuff. So you can burn through money very quickly. Um, and, you know, so to, to kind of dial back and again, give a little bit of backstory, we are a venture backed company and we, last summer we closed our B round. So we're pretty well funded and backed and people like us and we don't have a problem with money, um, but it's a product development company is, yeah, it's a lot of work, it's hard, um, and it, it, you kind of have to build product to kind of get a, a presence, and then it becomes easier and easier, and we're getting to that zone now where we have enough product in market, tar Target, and again, this isn't public information, but Target said later this summer they'll go full chain with some of our stuff, so that's like really exciting. Um, and it just, yeah, so it's kind of the thing where I guess in this case, you, know, you do have to kind of have that backing to kind of get yourself to a presence, and then it starts to make sense. Um, and it's, it's very daunting. I was saying it earlier um, with Professor Chesbro. Uh, you know, just to go up against the other consumer products that have been doing this for 30 years, and we're doing it for like three years, and even though we're smart people and we can figure it out, it's still very daunting because, you know, they have brand recognition. They're just, they're, you know, consumer walking in the, in the just off the street, you know, just as we found here in this uh, forum, I mean, only two people knew of Quirky, so people are going in there looking at it, just evaluating it as a product, product to product. They don't know the backstory, they don't really care that, that there's some dude's face on the back or some girl's face on the back. They, that's not, you know, that's irrelevant at the first, the first read at six feet. Um, so it's, yeah, it, there's some challenges, but we're definitely getting to a place where things are really starting to make sense for us, um, and we're getting better and better at what we do. Uh, and retailers really like us because we're very agile and very responsive. You know, I mean, to be able to bring a product from zero to market within like less than six months or six months, which is what we're probably going to do for this stuff for Target, is unheard of. It's risky, but it's it, it's kind of exciting. And the retailers, you know, again, is you know, if they're into it, they're you know, Target's number three retailer. If they're into it and they're excited by it, that's that's a good sign. So we're doing something right. Um, we have a lot to prove, but we're doing something right. Other questions? Um, could you maybe talk a little bit, I mean, you started to talk a little bit about um, your venture capital 
or your venture capital backed company. And mm -hmm. um, I think it'd be really interesting um, to hear a little bit about the relationship with your um, investors. So um, is there, this is a very different model like from other venture backed companies, I'm sure. And I wonder if there's any um, complications with or pressure from investors about like how you're going to scale and exit. Um, so just hearing a little bit about that would be really interesting. Yeah, um, I don't know if I have all of the data for you, but um, <clears throat> I mean, like I said, they're into it because they're into it for the, to some degree for the right reasons, uh, meaning they see it as a long term thing. They see it as really building a brand, a household name. You know, we don't want to be, I used to do a lot of design work for OXO Good Grips, you know, the black rubber handled kitchen utensils and stuff like that. And it's funny because a lot of times people say, so you got a lot of kitchen stuff, you're getting stuff in this kitchen category and they're like, um, so you want to be another OXO? And we're kind of like, no, we want to be another P&G. Like, we don't see ourselves as just another consumer brand. We see ourselves as like this household name this place to go, this trusted place to go to bring your idea, you know, to life, and people start understanding that that's what you're buying into when you buy that product. You know, our brand is complicated. It's not just the product, and th we have all kinds of crazy internal discussions around like, um, how do we make this stuff look the same? Should it look the same? Should it all look quirky? Like, it's really complicated because it doesn't just represent a product. It's not just a 3D brand. It's also this spirit of invention and, you know, doing the right thing for the right person. You know, it's it's so. Our investors, to some degree, believe in that story as well, so they're not so hard on us. But, um, you know, the reality is they're putting numbers in, they're expecting numbers. It's, it is a, there is a number side of it, unfortunately. Um, but we have some good people on our board um, who are not the investors. So we have, for instance, John Maida is on our board. Um, and so he's um, from MIT, and he's the president of RISD, and blah, blah, blah. You know, so from a design perspective, he can kind of keep educating the investors that, you know, what we're doing is, is, is a bigger picture here, you know, um, and, and it's a very transformative thing. The same way that you would say, like, Apple, what Apple did for what Apple does, right, or that kind of stuff, or, you know, that it's transformative. And so I think Quirky is sort of in that transformative space. So I'm going to piggyback on these la this last question uh, with one of my own sure. while, while you're thinking of the next question you're going to ask, um, and that is the way that you get paid, uh, I guess it also goes back to the business model question, too, that Jennifer, you asked. Um, you get paid by taking these things into the market, yeah. either directly through your own online stores, indirectly through your partners like Target and the others. Um, but it seems like your branding has really been very carefully focused on your community uh, and, the, and the things feeding into that, and that there isn't really much yet to the final consumer uh, or even the retailer. Uh, at the, the point of purchase display you had, for example, had quirky, but there was no tagline, there was no descriptor, there, other than a color and a logo, there was just the word. There was no information for the consumer about what quirky was. Mm -hmm. It was just the, the name on top of the rack of all these interesting yeah. power products yeah. that you had. And so I wonder, given that this is how you get paid, and yet it's also where, in some respects, your brand is the least developed, if that's going to pose some challenges for you. Yeah. Um, like I said, for, for me, it, it's one of the more, it's like the most complicated part of what we're doing, in a way. Um, and it, for me, I'm like a systems person, so I try to make sense of the system. And uh, huh. I find it, it, from day one, for me, it was always like, well, what's the brand? What's the brand stand for? What is the brand? You know, how do we talk about the brand? And, it, and it's always been this sort of like moving, constantly moving target of what that is, what that means. Um, and I think, you know, um, for better or for worse, we've been thrust, thrust into the, you know, such a major retailer. Um, it's going to be very interesting because it's not, you know, it's not like we've had a lot of opportunity to kind of, you know, play in the minor leagues <laughs> and learn on how to do this effectively um, and what to find out what resonates or not, you know. And, uh, and I still struggle with, I think, that, like I said, the fact that a consumer is really looking at a product as, is it a good product, is it a beautiful product, and not necessarily the, all of the backstory. I think brands, at the end of the day, there's like the soul of a product is sort of like the brand. What I mean by that is when you leave the product behind and you step away from it, and then you, you, 
you evoke some sort of thought or something about that product when it's not there with you. So there's like the soul of it. To me, then that's got to connect with the brand. And um, you know, so for us, I think it is about the spirit of invention. But like you said, it's kind of interesting. We don't even say quirky, uh, you know, spirit of invention or something. Or we make, you know, we say we make invention accessible, but it's again, it's not. At retail, what does that really mean to someone? Because at that point, they're in there buying something. They just want to buy something. They're not there to invent. <laughs> you know, so, it's, so it is an interesting sort of um, Well, and it's also challenge. silent on what is the customer experience that you, are, you can expect from a quirky product. Yeah. So lots of things, again, toward the front end, the, the people contributing in. Yeah. So no, no criticism there. It seems like yeah. that part's been thought about, developed. You've worked yeah. hard on it. This other part just seems like it's not yet developed. Yeah. Anyway, okay, so next question. Um, I was wondering about the composition of the team composition in Quirky. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I would guess you guys are not all designers and not all marketing people. So, what is the composition? Yeah, um, good question. Like I said <clears throat> earlier, um, it's, it's a pretty interesting sort of. Uh, company and that's why I said like a lot of times we don't really I don't feel like we have contemporaries because there's, we're like so many different companies jammed into one so there is uh, you know a major force uh, kind of at the company is definitely the design group uh, which to some degree consists of industrial designers and engineers um, so I would say that's probably like a um, it's not a third maybe a fourth a fourth of the company roughly Something like that, um, and then from there, it's sort of you know some of the other real major pieces is the um, the tech team, so doing sort of to make sure that this web machinery is working perfectly. There's a lot of stuff there going on. There's an e-commerce site. There's all these different phases and different materials and and stuff. So that whole tech side of it is very important. So there's um, you know a lot of people do developing and coding and so forth. I mean, the beauty of a lot of this is uh, because we have all these different sort of groups is that you know our um, our ability to sort of develop things. We, we're doing it all in house. Um, there's a, a communications team doing all the graphic design and all the photography and all the videography in house. We have our own photo studio in house. Um, so that's like another major uh, facet. Um, the uh, out of that, uh, in addition to that, would be like operations, so handling all the logistics, shipping, and stuff like that. So we have people dedicated to that. Um, and then there's there's legal. As I'm getting down, there there's smaller and smaller numbers. You know, there's like one or two people, but. Um, so like legal would be like there's two two people handling like the legal side of things, which is like all the contracts and stuff that we may have to do, but then also the all the patent law stuff, filing of patents, filing of provisional applications. Um, as you can imagine, it's kind of a nightmare from an uh, intellectual property point of view, meaning we're putting this stuff out there to the world um, before the product exists. So it's kind of tricky. <clears throat> um, but yeah, it's uh, and then there's sales, there's sales um, and brand management and kind of stuff. But again, like onesies, one onesies around. So it's, um, it's about 70 people, roughly. I wanted to see how accurate the crowdsourcing model has been in terms of um, signaling future success for a product. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes people will indicate that they're interested in a product sort of ostensibly, but then once it's actually up for sale, they won't purchase it. I mean, wh what's the connection there in terms of um, the feedback you get? Yeah. Um, Excellent question. I don't know if we've dialed it in yet, so I don't know if we really know. Um, I think we're still doing it a little bit old-fashioned, you know, um, intuitive gut reads on things and based on relationships with retailers and stuff like that. So, but you do have the thresholds. We do have threshold. We do have other data coming in, um, but I think you know, uh, for us, it's sort of a little bit of like it gives us the warm and fuzzy, but it's not like we're using that hard and fast data. Um, is that a study you'd be interested in? Uh, I think it's an excellent study, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. Um, Anybody looking for something to do for the summer? Uh, <laughs> yeah, come no, on I, down. Yeah, the retailers, I mean, this to me is sort of this territory where, again, it's not like focus groups and these kinds of things are new. The point is that we're starting to get, tap into, it's a, it's, a, you know, it's a different level of community. You know, I worked for a design firm where, you know, we would, we're developing some mops, and so we'd go out and meet with you know ten housewives in New Jersey or something, you know, and like that was our sample size, you know, and we give them some Starbucks gift cards and pay them a hundred bucks or whatever, you know. It's like, it's not 
really that interesting. And it's so many companies have been doing it like that forever, and they're still doing it that way, and still rely on that information and that data. And of course, they use outside consultants so they can kind of cover their ass. So it's this sort of weird thing. It, does, it doesn't actually develop real data that people really feel good about. I think we are getting closer and closer to having real interesting data. Um, and it will just take a little more time and, and, and so forth. But. John, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so our last thing to act together as a class is we're going to do uh, the course evaluations. So uh, if you need uh, pencils or pens, uh, come up here. Uh, so Young will uh, collect them uh, and take them back. Uh, I also need my attendance sheet, which I think is probably over there. Uh, we already gave you back the power pivot, I think. Sure. So you got that back. Oh, sure. All right, good. Super. Does anybody else need a pencil? Okay. Oh, we got, yeah, you can share, yeah. 